So, <laughs> talking about testament people. <laughs> ah, naming the waters naming the bible verses naming the chapters all that good stuff you know how it is isn't it oh mate you know how it is we're all here ready to go man let's continue on so as i was saying before i was rudely interrupted by my wi-fi cutting out i'm gonna play this clip um taken from the tim dylan show where he speaks about Shorb and his lack of understanding as to why this guy is deciding to do stand-up when he could do anything else in the world. And I think it's a really interesting clip. So I'm going to play that again, and we're going to go from the start. I'm not going to pause or interrupt it, and we're going to try and finish this as quickly as possible. I'm going to take the thing off the screen too so you can see yourself in the chat because obviously it's white text. But let's just start this and see if this works. And what are you going to do, right? We're not going to spend the whole episode. Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, well, welcome to the Tim Dillon Patreon episode uh, here in uh, California, sunny California, coming out uh, tonight. It's Thursday. Recorded with Luis Gomez today. Fun episode. You think people will get angry? I think people are going to love it. Yeah, but what? What? But the? Uh, you, do I think the LA comedy scene will be mad? Is that your question? Yes. Um, perhaps. I Why? Think... <laughs> Why? Uh, some things were just said uh, about the L.A. comedy scene. You, you and Lewis don't, uh, uh, you don't uh, bullshit when it comes to that stuff. Well, you... I mean, listen, uh, everybody can hate everybody and love everybody, and that's what that is, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, like, we're, I think the good thing about the episode is, you know, we can't listen. You, we can't pretend that the Gringo Poppy is, is a good is a good comedy special, right? Like, I, I like Brendan as a person. People get mad at me. They're like, you're sitting on the fence. I'm like, I'm not sitting on the fence on that fact. Yeah, it is not bring the pain. Uh, uh, you know, but Brendan's trying to be a comedian. I don't know why. I don't know why a guy who's an Adonis who could just fuck women and kill men would want to live the life of the fucking jester. And, you know, me and Lewis kind of talk about that and... Again, it's just, mm -hmm. it's puzzling to me, right? Does he love comedy? Does Brendan genuinely love comedy? I don't think so. I don't. I mean, I don't. you know, like. He doesn't seem like a guy that grew up listening like, what to What if Carlin I tried to be a picks. model? Mm -hmm. What if I tried to be a model? Like, what if the biggest modeling, uh, what if the biggest model in the world was my friend mm -hmm. and said I should model? And then I started modeling. And then the other models were like, why are you modeling? And I'm like, well. People like when I model, and they go, okay, but it's not really modeling. And I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, well, it's just, you don't, you know, this is not, you're not like a model. Like, did you always want to be a model? And I'm like, yeah, I've always loved models. They go, yeah, but that's a little different, right? Did you always, like, what about you would want to be a model? And I'm just like, well, I'm just eating like nachos. And I go, well. <laughs> I'm trying to be a model and it's hard. It's like, it's kind of that where it's like, you know, it's uh, it's an interesting thing. But it's since Rogan left, LA podcast, the podcast scene here has kind of collapsed. Mm -hmm. And what are you going to do, right? We're not going to spend the whole episode talking about this because it doesn't affect anyone and it's kind of silly. I just hope nobody's offended. That's all. Because we never, I mean, I, I mean we're never trying to offend anyone. Mm -hmm. We don't dislike anyone. No, but no, you know what? That No one cares about that. You know, I say that all the time, mm -hmm. too. We don't dislike anyone. We also don't like anyone. <laughs> so, you know, and, 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 and uh, you know what I mean? Like, this whole idea of I don't dislike people, it doesn't mean anything. Sure. You know, and I say point. that, too. It's not your fault. Yeah. You're, you're parroting kind of the thing I say all the time, where I go, we don't like anyone, but no one cares. Nobody cares. Like, I'm like, we don't dislike anyone. That's not comforting. You know what I mean? To mm -hmm. anyone. You know, you know, you, you, you that no one cared. That's not like a qualifier that matters to anybody. When you go, yeah, I don't dislike anyone. Mm. I don't really like anyone either. I just, they're all, you know, we're all just in our own lane driving down a highway, mm. you know, watching other, you know, people and seeing what else it is. But listen, a lot of people don't like stand up. People don't like my stand up. My special's coming out. People are going to go, I don't like that. It's fine. Mm. It is what it is, you know? I mean, what are you going to do? Um, there's not much you know that you can you can do about that i think far too many people are you know la you know you know somebody brought up a good point to me they go, the la podcast seems it's become a bad reality show that nobody cares about and that's why 
you know, people are losing interest in it, I think, rapidly. So that, that's why what we try to do is, is, is different, and hopefully the shit we talk about affects uh, people in a, in a positive way, in the sense that it makes them happy or laugh. And, you know, I mean, they, you know, because we're not, we're not, like, I'm not invested in this scene at all. I don't care if we do this show from Florida. I don't care if we do it from Texas. I don't care if we do it from New York. I don't, it, it's, I, I don't feel like I even live here. You know, I, I came here from New York. I've been an outsider. None of these people showed me any respect until Rogan had me on. It's a fact. None of them looked at me in the eye or talked to me until, except Bert. Bert had me on Bert before did. Joe. Yeah. Bert had me on. But he, he thought I was Fortune Feimster, <laughs> but it still counts. Uh, but yeah, so I mean, it's it's not, again, I'll, I'll, again, I'll repeat the meaningless horse shit. I don't dislike it. Uh, but yeah, I, this is all just what it is, right? I mean, there's, let's not romanticize this and make this into something mm -hmm. that it isn't. We're all just kind of out here, but this, this ain't nothing. This ain't a community. This is not a scene, even though I use the word scene because there's no other word. Mm -hmm. This is a loose association of people that don't care about each other and frankly like to watch each other crash and burn. That's really what it is. People who get a lot of pleasure out of watching other people's watching their lives become unmanageable. That's really what it is. It's not at all any type of family or there's, there's very little camaraderie. Nobody hangs out with each other. People barely know each other. Mm. Uh, and that's what kind of shocked me when I came out here. You know, in New York, people hang out with each other. They talk to each other. They go over each other's houses for barbecues. Here you come out and you realize that nobody really does anything with each other. Nobody sees each other outside of being on the show. Mm. That's it. So, I mean, you know. I'll so, that's where we're going to end it quickly. And just some quick points to pull from this, which I mentioned previously. Number one, which I said beforehand, before the podcast, you know, into rudely flipping cut off because of my crappy Wi-Fi. Why is Brendan doing this? Why is he putting himself through this when he's clearly making a bucket load of cash via podcasting? I mentioned it previously, but someone on the Fire Kid subreddit leaked how much the ad buys are on the Fire and the Kid. I think maybe it might have been maybe King and the Sting um, only, but still, let's imagine that those rates are the same across the Fire and the Kid, and the rates were anywhere between 5 to 20k per ad buy. So if you're a company that's selling, let's say, staplers, you would have to pay anywhere between 5 to 20k to get them to read your ads for i don't know whatever set amount of time you want on their podcast i think some of it was like free drops you know per episode which is crazy and they usually have quite a lot of different companies they advertise on there from a pillow thing to something about sleeping to you know mental health or the better help stuff so they clearly are raking in loads of money through that loads of money through adsense and all that good stuff and anything else that comes off the back of it so if if that's the case and you're making all that and you're doing free shows per week plus the other things he's doing with king of the sting and the other shows he's doing and blow the bell all this not blow the bell um the food truck diaries why put yourself through stand-up especially when you have to do the expenses you have to pay people it just doesn't make any sense and plus it will it seems that all comedians are really bitchy and backstabby and stuff it just doesn't make any sense why he'd want to do it but then also someone mentioned in the chat that, oh, it probably is a money thing because clearly he's got some crazy expenses, right? Um, he has to flip in, you know, he, he's got flipping loads of luxury cars. He has clearly a wife that maybe has some sort of expensive taste. He has two kids. He's probably putting through private school. It's not cheap to be, kind of live his life. I'd imagine his monthly bills are absolutely insane that he has to clear. So maybe that's the reason. Or maybe it's narcissism. Maybe he just wants to be the person on stage, getting all the adulation. Maybe it's similar to, maybe it kind of fills that hole of not being a professional athlete where, you know, essentially professional athlete kind of all eyes are on you. So maybe the next thing down from doing that, if you can't DJ and you can't, you know, um, sing or you can't use an instrument or play an instrument, sorry, the next best thing is to get on stage and tell dick's jokes. Maybe that's the thing. The other thing that I thought was interesting too was what um, Tim Dillon said about um, the people, about the the comedy scene or community not being a community or scene at all that's very enlightening and i think we're seeing a lot of it now ever since joe rogan left it seems like when joe rogan was around everyone played nice everyone pretended they were friends or at least friends with who joe was friends with to give the illusion that things were good which why i feel like those things that brendan or 
used to say all the time, how good is the comedy store right now? It was only good for him at that time because he was friends with Joe Rogan. They were pulling up to the comedy store in their flashy cars, you know, playing their own shows, shooting the shit in the parking lot after the show, getting some food, hanging out, doing each other podcasts and making each other rich and successful and famous. And in the moment, the big dog stepped away from it, everything imploded. But it's also funny. I think what he said about um, no one showing him respect until Joe Rogan gave him the stamp of approval is interesting because you would imagine Tim Dillon's personality and how he goes on, he'd be kind of a perfect fit for those type of, type of people over there. But clearly some of them maybe, you know, maybe felt a little bit um, threatened by his presence that he might take over, which he basically clearly did because he ended up being now, you know, um, Joe's basically new favorite comedian to have on his show because of how flipping crazy and off the, you know, and basically how he basically shoots from the hip all the time. Maybe that's the whole point of it. But clearly those uh, suspicions that you had about people not really vibing for him were basically um, well-founded. And then it also reminded me a little bit of my own history where I realized very quickly when I was kind of coming up in the streetwear sneaker industry or streetwear sneaker scene here in the UK, a scene that I was obsessed with from the minute I, you know, bought my first kind of limited edition shoe and the minute I bought my first piece of Supreme clothing when I was like 15 or something. I remember quite clearly um, how crappy some of the store assistants in our really famous streetwear and skateboarding stores here in the UK, especially in London, would treat you, especially someone like me being a black kid from the ends. There wasn't a lot of us that kind of went into shots, but you know, forget the black thing. It was mostly just a cool thing. They felt like they were cooler than you. So they'd always kind of vibe you out of the store and make you feel less than. You couldn't touch things. You couldn't ask questions or they wouldn't even answer sometimes if you asked a question. And I remember distinctly how quickly their tunes changed to me. You know, I would, I would shop there between the uh, ages between, they say ages between 15 and 18 on my own. And then suddenly I, I was able to get a little internship at this really cool up and coming streetwear brand that used to exist here in the UK called 12 Bar. They then moved across to LA for a bit, but I don't think they're around anymore. But I was doing internship for this brand called 12 Bar, and one of the founders was really friendly with all the big people in LA in terms of, you know, um, streetwear people like, you know, um, I know Bobby Hundreds and all those type of people. They came over and they visited us when, when we were working over there. And I remember distinctly how different those guys in those stores acted when Bobby Hundreds visited London and the founder of 12 Bar took me and Bobby Hundreds around the shops and, and out for some dinner and some drinks after. So we went and visited all the same shops that were used to give me the cold shoulder. And the way that they were sucking me off, like, cluck, cluck, 3,000, you would have thought I was fucking Jamie Foxx the way they were flipping going after me. But clearly it was because I was getting the ultimate cosign with the person I was coming in the room with. And from that moment on, it gave me the flipping determination to just make sure I was successful so that I could have these very same people flipping, licking the floor that I was walking on. Because I realised right then it wasn't a matter of talent it wasn't a matter of what can you bring to the community or scene it was just who are you friends with and that was how they basically um, would gauge their friendships with people and I think it was completely horrible and it really turned me off to it in general so that might also be the reason why Tim has gone so aggressive with his Patreon and basically doing his own thing because he doesn't really partake in the LA comedy scene at all. He's not really part of the Austin scene anymore. He just wanders around doing shows, staying in fancy hotels, you know, shouting at flipping Ben on the podcast and just living a good life, in it. And that might be because of how ostracized and how mistreated he felt with the LA comedy scene and whatnot. Obviously for him it's worked out, but I think in general, now we know, you know, since this whole Brendan thing has kind of blown up, that whole comedy family thing they tried to make it seem as they were all friends and stuff was never true they were only friends because rogan was around and everyone wanted to be pally pally with rogan so by proxy you'd have to be pally pally with brendan and brian the moment rogan left and those guys got accused of diddling one of them got accused of rape and whatnot it gave everybody an excuse to just not talk to them anymore because they probably didn't like them in the first place anyway that was it so let's move on that ramble was enough i gave you a bit of my life story I complained about stuff. I made it about me a little bit, you know, because clearly when you do a podcast, the best thing you got to do is make it about you. 